The insanity defense can be confusing. The McNaughton rule requires the defendant to show that because of mental illness, the defendant either did not know what he was doing, or if he did, that he did not know it was wrong. How could the defendant be convicted anyway if he did not know what he was doing? The Model Penal Code commentary gives this example. Suppose the defendant choked someone to death but thought he was squeezing a lemon. Hey, if life gives you lemons, you make lemonade, right? An actor who does not know he is harming or risking harm to a person lacks culpability and should not be convicted anyway. Who needs the insanity defense here? The Model Penal Code acknowledges that if the defendant lacks a culpable mental state, the law normally does not inquire into why. Therefore, we need to take care to note the difference between negating culpability and excluding responsibility. Evidence of mental disease can be relevant in either or both of these two ways. It might negate culpability as when the defendant perceived a lemon rather than a human. Or it might exclude responsibility as when a defendant knows what he's doing but is incapable of knowing it is wrong to do it. Evidence that the defendant suffered from a mental disease or defect is admissible whenever it is relevant to prove that the defendant did or did not have a state of mind which is an element of the offense. As we would expect and hope, the model penal code sticks to its general principle that mistake or ignorance are always relevant if they tend to prove or negate the culpability the offense requires. Separately, Mental disease or defect excluding responsibility is an affirmative defense. So expert psychiatric testimony is admissible for either or both of two purposes, to rebut the prosecution's case in chief and or to establish an affirmative defense. Notice that under the model penal code, the burden of showing culpability beyond a reasonable doubt remains on the prosecution. The state of Arizona, for one, has taken a different stance. In Clark versus Arizona, the defendant wanted to have the jury hear expert psychiatric testimony for the purpose of rebutting the state's case in chief. Clark had shot a policeman thinking he was an extraterrestrial being. The Arizona court ruled that the testimony could only be admitted in support of an affirmative defense. Clark appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. The court affirmed the Arizona ruling, rejecting Clark's due process clause challenge. The court wrote, because allowing mental disease evidence on mens rea can easily mislead, the state may address that tendency by confining this kind of evidence to insanity on which a defendant may be assigned the burden of persuasion. The court thus allows the states, like Arizona, to confine psychiatric evidence to the affirmative defense of legal insanity. Consider the defendant who thought he was squeezing lemons, who introduces psychiatric testimony to bolster that unlikely story. In states like Arizona, the defendant now bears the burden of persuasion, not the prosecution, as to the issue of whether he possessed the culpable mental state. Let's take a step back and look at the model penal code formulation of the affirmative excluding responsibility defense of legal insanity. The model penal code formulation was initially very influential. It was, in effect, adopted as the law of the Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in the case of Blake versus United States. Blake extended an earlier case in the circuit, Davis. The Davis standard was as follows. The term insanity means 
such a perverted and deranged condition of the mental and moral faculties as to render a person incapable of distinguishing right and wrong. Or his will has been otherwise involuntarily so completely destroyed that his actions are not subject to it, but are beyond his control. Or his will. This is good news for defendants like Blake, who despite his schizophrenia and apparent psychotic episode, knew what he was doing and that it was criminal. The addition of a so-called volitional prong in Davis was inspired by the model penal code. But Davis did not adopt the model penal code formulation entirely. Davis requires utter incapacity rather than what the model penal code calls substantial capacity. Requiring the defendant to show that his mental disease had completely destroyed his self-control left a powerful line of rebuttal open to the prosecution. The prosecution can argue that the defense fails the policeman at the elbow test. The argument is, in short, that the fact finder should convict unless convinced that the defendant would have engaged in exactly the same criminal conduct if there had been a policeman at his elbow. This means that any kind of precautionary behavior by the defendant can be seized upon as proof that his will had not been completely destroyed. He was using his will to avoid detection or capture. In Blake, the court notes that the defendant has no defense under Davis, but does have a defense under the model penal code. The Blake court adopted the model penal code insanity defense in full as the law of the Fifth Circuit. The model penal code provision reads like this. A person is not responsible for criminal conduct if at the time, as a result of mental disease or defect, he lacks substantial capacity either to appreciate the criminality of such conduct or to conform his conduct to the requirements of law. Even an actor whose will has not been completely destroyed may yet lack substantial capacity to control himself. The adoption of the standard of substantial capacity may well be the code's most significant alteration. What difference does the word substantial make? Well, it means measured, substantial measured by the standard of humanity in general, as opposed to the most severe afflictions of the mind. Think of it this way. The standard of humanity in general means playing with a full deck. Some of us might be missing the four clubs or something, but you know what I mean. Lacking substantial capacity means not playing with a full deck, being more than a card or two short. Not necessarily as bad as the most severe impairments. It's a mean between two extremes. Here's another example. The English artist Lewis Wayne suffered progressive schizophrenia and ultimately psychosis. Degrees of impairment are recognized by the model penal code, but traditional tests like Davis require utter or extreme dissociation. Suppose Wayne is charged with animal cruelty. At what point in his descent would he cease to be responsible? Well, a little bit of cruelty here, but disturbed. Uh, these, these cats. Hmm. Uh, this one, uh, a little bit scary. Uh, ugh. <clears throat> I think we can agree that somewhere before we reach the end of the series, Wayne had lost substantial capacity. It is indeed a matter of degree. The law is full of instances in which the court and juries are explicitly authorized to confront an issue of degree. Such is no less appropriate in dealing with insanity. There was a trend across jurisdictions to come around to this view. And then came the Hinckley case.